May you lose your winning ticket and the gun not go off when it's supposed to. May your reflux be acid and your bowel be cranky. May your water forever be cloudy and the pharmacy be shut. May the funeral parlour refuse you and the lies you told haunt you long after the cat has made a litter tray of your ashes. Welcome to Spokes. I'm Colette Colfer and in this episode I'm talking to the Irish poet Kevin Higgins. Kevin has a unique voice in the Irish poetry scene. He uses satire and humour and he uses poetry to engage with political issues. I spoke to him during lockdown 2020. The audio quality of his voice is variable because he's speaking through a handheld phone so you'll hear the odd tonal change or pop. We've played around with the editing a bit more than usual in this one, and we've used music to highlight some of his brilliant one-liner gems. You'll also hear him recite a few poems. I was born in London in 1967. I was born during the Summer of Love. And uh, then we moved when I was three to Coventry in uh, the West Midlands, where they were running out of workers, apparently, at the time. Uh, And we lived there for four years. And uh, that's the kind of halcyon, glowing childhood memories that I would have. And then we came back to Ireland. And then I remember Ireland seeming like an incredibly black and white place. It was single sex school. We had a mixed school in Coventry, even though it was a Catholic school. Uh, So it was a it was a grim place. Both of Kevin's parents were from the Mayo Galway border, but they had migrated to England around 1959, 1960. They would have always referred to Ireland as home. Uh, And even though I'd never lived here until I was seven, Ireland was home. Kevin got involved in politics when he was a teenager. He joined the Labour Party in Galway. He moved back to the UK in 1988 and became involved in anti-poll tax demonstrations there. He was an activist until around the age of 27 when he returned to Galway. You see, my actual aim in 1994 or 5 was to start writing poetry as a way of getting away from politics. Now that has been a total failure. Galway wasn't exactly a half-horse town in the 1980s, but it was a dull place. And there weren't many people from anywhere else in it. Uh, And suddenly it was the place where all these groovy people, inverted commas, groovy, uh, were uh, coming to find themselves from all around the world and do artistic things and all that. And this is... uh, um, the last line belongs to Nicholas the barman at Garavan's pub. He did actually say this, uh, what is in the last line of this poem. A real Galwegian. Because when you watch the woman sitting next to you writing an email in what looks like Korean, or find yourself asking someone called Candy from Saskatchewan for two bagels with cream cheese, it occasionally still hits you how it's like the blink of an eyelid since down this street the coffee was rotten and a night out just a pint of sad smittix eventually emerging in a withered hand from a back street hatch a barman telling a complaining yank how the lock broken on that toilet door has been that way for nearly 20 years and not a single shit stolen yet I would have come to poetry through a a in in a, on a, a longer route through a concern about how uh, things can be communicated better. 
and that uh, uh, nothing annoys me more and, and, uh, uh, than uh, something I agree with that's said badly. Um, because I think it kind of gives hostages to the other side. They are important, the facts, certainly. But if you can get someone to laugh at something that they think they believe in, then you, do, you move their mind in some really important uh, uh, way and they, they listen at least. They mightn't agree at all, but they do uh, listen. Poets are meant to be concerned people. Now, nothing annoys me more than concerned people, I have to say. Poetry is always middle class because, generally speaking, more educated people than the average write poetry. That's, now, that's a sweeping statement, and there, it's challenged by... It's challenged by... Um, I don't mean they're more intelligent, but I do mean they've, they've been stuck into more schools and universities. Um, there is the popular tradition of poetry, like uh, which rap is a part of, uh, which a lot of spoken word is a part of, but even there it is quite middle class and middle class in world view, more importantly. I mean, I'm bloody middle class myself, completely now, but um, the, uh, there is a narrow range of acceptable views, which broadly, and I have published poems in there and articles, uh, the broad viewpoint of papers like the Irish Times, the Guardian, and the New York Times. And the Irish poetry world is no different to uh, the poetry world in America and uh, Britain. And there are narrow, uh, there are, there's a kind of a prescribed point of view. A thing we have to uh, comfort ourselves with is that people die. It's like the snow globe. The snow globe will be reshaken and it will, uh, uh, there'll be a reset. I believe very, very, very strongly in apprenticeships. I think any poet should be looking for an audience beyond just the literary. I really believe in working on people, your poems and making them better and all of that. And that happens via other poets and other people who are interested in poetry and so on. And that's an internal poetry world thing. But another stage is testing those poems on broader audiences. And I don't see any point learning to do something really well and then keeping it only for the enjoyment of other people who also do that to a certain standard. I think there's a lack of self-confidence in that. And I think uh, whatever type of poem uh, you write, that there is uh, an audience now. And it's one of the greatest uh, um, creations of the internet in a way which has many, many downsides. Absolutely. But it... Uh, it has. It is playing a democratizing uh, role because the mainstream publications cannot any longer lock out poems. I'd never write anything for shock value or for a particular publication. But when I finish a poem, I would think, okay, where could that go now? And it's different answers for different sorts of. Uh, poems but i think people should never if they if you start tapering what you're saying or thinking to fashion or and remember that's all it is there are fashions of poetry and there are the equivalent of platform shoes that we will look at in 20 years time and think jesus they actually did that when people say you can't say that you can't write it that way that's too silly, too dark, too mean, too cynical. 
Uh, whenever anyone says to me that a poem is too mean, I think of uh, Jonathan Swift's poem on the death of the late famous uh, Duke of Marlborough, where he basically cheers as you have now gone to the earth, back into the earth from which you sprung, and he's cheering at his death. Uh, he wrote it a week after he died. Uh, <laughs> imagine that now, and published, and his name is in the title uh, as well. Imagine the equivalent now. Um, and uh, I think for any, whatever type of poet you are, there's always someone that you think, and it's very, very, very unlikely that they are in the now. That's where people end up following fashion, that they try to be the next uh, whoever uh, from the current time. Uh, but the problem with that is it ends up like, a, you know that film Spinal Tap about the band who, where they try and follow every trend and they narrowly miss uh, them all and it ends up with, uh, uh, you end up not being very well defined at all, you know. Do you think poets have a duty? And if you do, what is the duty of a poet? Um... I think it's very, I think the main duty they have is to be true to themselves. Um, I think if you try and write things that are not coming from deep inside you, then it won't work and it will sound false. I think, unfortunately, when some people are, are false, they actually are being true to themselves because there are there are a lot of false people around and you'll always get those. For me, the poets I would be interested in most are those who are not writing to be simply to become part of some sort of establishment. I don't understand why people would write poetry to do that. It would seem that getting involved in selling insurance or cattle or something like that would be a much quicker uh, route to uh, getting in with society. So I think the, the, um, the, the duty I suppose poets have, if I could boil it down, would be not to see poetry just as a, a means of kind of rising in society themselves. I could nearly run uh, workshops for people how to deal with a witch hunt. There's a thing that happens with witch hunts is they try and isolate people. And they try and make you feel as if you're going crazy as well, which is a really important um, part of it. And I think the maintenance of humor, I remember, is very important. Uh, in the face of those things, because people who take themselves very, very seriously are never that never as serious as they pretend. I think it's important to realize that. And, and when you're dealing with a witch hunt like that, it's important to remember it will pass and it will not age well ever. I mean, I suppose the uh, there are people I would consider weather veins. I don't take what they say seriously. I don't think of them as thinkers. Kevin has a medical condition. It's an illness that requires regular hospital appointments. It's a autoimmune condition called sarcoidosis, which you can get anywhere in your body. Uh, in this part of the world, we tend to get it in our lungs, which is where I have it. And it basically your, your system thinks it's under attack and it isn't. So it's on a war footing all the time, which weakens you, makes you tired. And it's crucially, it scars your lungs. So I now only use 47% of the oxygen I take in. Uh, none of us use, I hate to break it to you, none of us use 100%. We all have a bit of wear and tear as we go on. But uh, at about 60%, you start to feel tired when you run up a stairs. So that sort of thing, that bit in the aging process. So I've reached that much uh, sooner. So I'm on very strong anti-inflammatories uh, for that, which makes me immuno, 
suppressant suppressed because uh, so I'm doubly vulnerable in relate. I went to the to a shop for the first time just before this, the first time in ten weeks, uh, which was a kind of a traumatic experience actually, and strange. You realise how isolated you become. You started your journey uh, with politics when you were 15. Have your ideas changed much since then? I, I think they have evolved a fair bit. I think when you're 15, you have very simple views of things. You also think you're the first person who ever discovered these things. Uh, I now know that I, I was not. Uh, and I think um, I always used to think yeah, well, just because you were 15 and you wanted to change the world didn't mean it was going to change because it doesn't, that's not the way it works. So sometimes it, it changes when it, when it's ready. Um, and, uh, but then I also remember thinking, well, just because you're 40 and you want to settle down and become middle-aged and jaded and um, complacent doesn't mean the world is going to let you do that either. I think that what is happening now in terms of grassroots uprisings and so on, that feeds up and that puts pressure on people in positions to make things better. And I don't think you need to think you're going to get utopia and perfection uh, at all. But you, if you try, if you try hard, you'll get you'll get things to be uh, better. And if you don't try and don't put pressure on people in positions for long periods of time, then things will get worse. A brief history of those who made their point politely and then went home. On this day of tear gas in Seoul and windows broken at Dickens and Jones, I can't help wondering why a history of those who made their point politely and then went home has never been written. Those who in the heat of the moment never dislodged a policeman's helmet, never blocked the traffic or held the country to ransom. Someone should ask them, was it all worth it? All those proud men and women who never had the National Guard sent in against them, who left everything exactly as they found it, without adding as much as a scratch to the paintwork, who no one bothered asking, are you or have you ever been? Because we all knew damn well they never ever were. Spooks is produced by Colette Golfer and Terry Hackett. If you'd like to read some of Kevin's poetry, he has five full collections of poems. His most recent book is Sex and Death at Merlin Park Hospital, which was published by Salmon in 2019. Like and subscribe and share the video. <laughs> there is no video. <laughs> Podcast. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. <laughs>